Hello again and welcome back to Illegally Cited. This is Jesse here and I figured I'd pop in this morning. We were recording this on Sunday morning, the big day of E3. Tons and tons of events today. But um, figured I'd do a quick video that would kind of summarize some of the stuff that happened yesterday. Uh, we had a few press briefings or whatever you want to call them. And uh, there was some interesting stuff actually. Um, started out with the Guerrilla Collective Day 2. Again, they showed a lot of different types of games, a lot of indie games especially. And these were, you know, a lot of them were actually pretty interesting. There was a lot of kind of 2D platformers. Uh, not quite sure if they were linear or Metroidvania. Um, there were a lot of um, isometric or overhead uh, action adventure, a couple of tactics or strategy type of games, but I'm seeing quite a few titles also that kind of reminded me of, you know, the, the gameplay style of The Legend of Zelda A Link to the Past. You know, you have the overhead view, the real-time combat. There was one I can't remember the name of uh, right at the moment, but I did go to the Guerrilla Collective uh, page on Steam, and I wish-listed again a whole bunch of titles. Um, <clears throat> but there's one that really, you know, it kind of had a, you know, a brighter art style because there was two specifically. There was one that had a kind of a darker, I don't want to say gory, but, you know, kind of a darker style to it. But it had that sort of overhead real-time combat vibe. And then there was a brighter one that kind of looked interesting. You know, you, the camera was a little bit closer. Um seemed to be focused quite a bit on melee combat and, you know, puzzles and dungeons and, you know, kind of your Zelda thing. So that kind of caught my attention. So that was pretty cool. Um, there was also a cool game that was um, kind of this... It wasn't really a first-person shooter from what I gathered. It was almost more of like a, hey, let's take a look at some Indiana Jones traps and make it... Uh, this really fast run, jump, slide, dash, obstacle course. You know, you're like hitting switches. There's time. There's timed traps and spikes and uh, like what do you call those? Like the guillotine or not the guillotine? Those uh, pendulum things with the blades and boulders rolling around and all kinds of chaos. That looked kind of interesting. Although I'd probably be terrible at it. Um, <clears throat> but like I said, there was a lot of games that were also the, your 2D platformer style. I'm not going to go into every one the way I have been, um, just because there are so many. You know, I mean, it's literally getting to the point where there's so many out there. Um, there wasn't really one game that just absolutely jumped out at me. Um, I do remember there was a game called Bat, B-A-T, and that was this sort of... Uh, really, really bloody uh, side-scrolling action game where you're, like, slashing, shooting dudes, and you had all those sort of, uh, I don't want to say generic, but I've heard a lot of those different uh, audio clips before, but it it, it kind of worked, uh, you know, like, just you're running through these sort of um, lab-type environments or um, industrial environments, and you're just cutting up dudes, and everybody's screaming, and it's just kind of chaos. Um, but that looked pretty cool. Um, and, you know, a lot of, like I said in, when I was streaming it yesterday, the a lot of these games were, they kind of have this, like, a flat art style to it, either that or, like, a low polygon art, art style. Like, we, I, I like the fact, again, that we've gotten to the point where we can be comfortable with not having to always, because that was, you know, in a couple generations ago, especially, you know, we're shooting for photorealism. Look at how real these graphics are. Just because we have more graphical power, that means we have to emulate real life. I don't know if uh, you've heard the news lately, but real life kind of sucks in a lot of ways. So, uh, no, I'm all for an escape, you know. I mean, yeah, we're possible, or, or you know, if if the the game calls for it or the story calls for it, sure. Go for a realistic art style, that's fine. But, you know, I'm totally fine with a just a really gorgeous art style, be it, you know, stylized or painted or 
flat shaded, cell shaded, whatever. Um, and more companies are doing that. I mean, even AAA developers look at something like um, look at something like Ubisoft's uh, Immortals: Phoenix Rising last year. Big open world game. Um, you know, you look at Breath of the Wild, um, all kinds of stuff. But so Guerrilla Collective, it was pretty good. Um, like I said, I, there's nothing that really that jumped out that said, "Oh God, I gotta have that." Uh, but there were a lot of solid titles that I did add to my wish list. The big event, though, yesterday is Ubisoft. That one really kicked off the whole AAA part of E3, I think, yesterday. And I've heard mixed opinions so far about Ubisoft. I know some people liked it, some people were really disappointed. Personally, I thought they were did. A, I thought they did a great job. Um, I was interested in, I would say, the vast majority of games. And I uh, got a shout out really quickly to my man, uh, Brandon. He's been in some of my uh, YouTube or my, uh, my Twitch streams a few times. Brandon Cole, uh, I immediately recognized him. I saw him on his comment on Twitter and replied after the, after the show yesterday. They started with a Rainbow Six Extraction um, trailer and then gameplay demo. And for both of those, he was the reader for the audio described version. As soon as it's, it took like probably four, you know, three, four words. And I'm like, wait a minute, that's totally Brandon. Yep. Super blind man. So on Twitter. So he, uh, yeah, he, uh, did, you know, I, we, t we tuned into the audio described version of the Ubisoft conference, which was great. Cool. By the way. And, uh, you know, he described the uh, segments for Rainbow Six Extraction, and that game looks really kind of cool. I've always liked the idea of Rainbow Six, like Rainbow Six Siege. Um, I really wish I could have played the Rainbow Six Vegas. I tried it, but again, even back then, the graphics and, like, you know, again, you get hit once and pow, you're dead. Like, you have to shoot the enemies before they even notice you, otherwise you're toast. So, uh, neat games to watch, but it's just, I have trouble playing them. So, um, I, I really want to like Extraction. It looks really cool. So, the whole point of this is, you've got what they, these operators, as they call them, so these people that are in the regular Rainbow Six Siege games, one of them has been captured, I guess, by these aliens that have come and... You know, you got all these different types of uh, aliens and pods and this, uh, I forget what they call it, but this kind of black gooey surface that's on the ground and it's like this uh, hive mentality. So like if you touch that surface, like, you know, the, um, it's like this collective conscious thing and so you break up the, you break up the kind of the sludge on the floor to get through it and that way you know that part of the area isn't controlled by them but you're ultimately trying to rescue your um your uh teammates and um it's a th one to three player i guess you can play it solo up to three players which is good you know we're kind of getting the you know we're, there's a lot of games that are evoking sort of a left for dead vibe and kind of putting their own spin on it like uh gtfo which is out um that one i don't know that you can really play that by yourself or it doesn't work that well if you can i mean i was sort of interested in it there's another couple that are already out um that have a twist on it and, you know world war z um but then you got back for blood coming out you've got this um oh, there's another one there's at least one or two other ones that are sort of giving me that vibe and I can't remember what they're called um but yeah so I, I like this sort of idea of cooperative uh humans versus AI sort of a thing because PvP unless it's something that really clicks with me and I can actually see it well enough to do halfway decently I'm much more for PvE you know um and so this looks cool I do have a lot of different accessibility questions, though, for a game like this Rainbow Six Extraction. Um, first, like, I hope to God that it's anything like um, a lot of Ubisoft games last year, where, you know, they talked about loadouts and upgrades and 
gadgets and things. I hope that menu user interface, I hope they carry all this text-to-speech and other accessibility forward, possibly even improve that aspect of it, but they're doing pretty good with that. So I hope that makes it into this game, even though it's not an open-world title like they've been doing last year. So fingers crossed that that happens, because that would be wonderful. Um, they say it's one to three players, uh, but what I'm wondering is if you're playing solo, are you just solo and that's it? Or do you have AI bots a la Left 4 Dead that can kind of help you and revive you or you revive them if you need or whatever, however it works? Um, I'm curious if you have any sort of AI assistance if you're playing solo or if you're playing with two people, does that... Does that third slot get filled up with AI? Um, yeah, so, I mean, those are the major things that I'm sort of curious about. Um, you know, the how difficult it is. I'm curious, like, can you take, you know, I won't say a ton of damage, but can you take more damage than your typical Rainbow Six game? I mean, is it more kind of like Left 4 Dead? You can take a little bit of a beating, Um or is it like, oh, if an if an alien swipes at you once or twice, you're down? Because um, that will definitely, you know, even on a lower difficulty, that will affect my enjoyment and ability even to play the game. So I do have lots of questions, but potentially um, this could be one of the more the most I've been intrigued about. A re um, I was going to say Resident Evil. Um, most intrigued I've been about a Rainbow Six game in a while. So I believe that's coming out in like September or later. Th I know it's later this year. I want to say September. Um, that looks cool though. Speaking of September, another game that looks just kind of fun is this Riders Republic. Um, Riders Republic is this sort of open world, um, <laughs> recreational like on a partly extreme sports-esque um collection of activities where you can explore you can um you know you can explore on your own you can compete with others there's massive events where you're competing with like a hundred and some other people but it's cool because you can do a lot of different activities you can do mountain biking you can do uh skiing snowboarding uh like hang gliding um, you got these little rocket bike things. You've got, God, I don't even know. Like, I mean, they they showed probably like a half a dozen different vehicles at least. You know, different things you can do. And though that, uh, I did a video for these. What is it called? Descenders, I think it was called. And you're driving these mountain bikes down these twisty roads down a hill, and it's really easy to lose control of that bike. You're always just on the brink of like wiping out. And they showed a lot of, that's the thing, is they showed a lot of actual gameplay for these modes. The snowboarding, the uh, the biking, whatever. And I'm just looking, you know, and they have this, they have, I think, a third and a first person view. And you're seeing this first person view of them just careening down these gravel hills or taking these jumps. I'm like, going, oh god, I'm so going to bite it hard <laughs> in these tracks. But... It looks fun. Um, it's coming out September second, and again, I you know I just I hope that their user interface, like you know the game itself, I don't necessarily expect to be fully blind playable, but even low vision accessible. Like I hope that like the map, the activities that you can choose, the menus, all of I don't know if you get up you get upgrades or what you know. I just hope all of that. Again, I I this isn't your typical like Assassin's Creed or Watch Dogs game. I'm hoping, and the way that Ubisoft is embracing accessibility, even going as so far as audio description on their trailers and their E3 events, like, I, I hope that just going forward, it's just kind of like an expectation, oh, our games are just going to have at least this base level of menu and UI narration. That would be fantastic. That would make... <clears throat> these games I'm talking about even better. So, yeah, really kind of looking forward to that. 
it just sounds fun. Like, especially the, uh, they showed a little segment of the snowboarding thing. And the way they do it is you're on, like, each area is sort of associated with a team that you can choose to join or that you're assigned to or whatever. And it's kind of like Tony Hawk graffiti. Like, you'll see objects on the mountain, like rails you can grind or ramps. And if you successfully land the highest combo trick uh, off of that item, it turns your color. And I can totally get down with some graffiti with some snowboarding, especially if the, you know... I'm curious what the controls for the snowboarding will be because I remember the original 1080 snowboarding. Uh, that was a blast. Um, but I've tried a couple other snowboarding games that have been a little... Yeah, I haven't really quite mastered the controls as much. But Riders Republic um, actually looks quite good. My only concern, or my major concern... <laughs> is if I don't have a new rig by then, I don't know what the system requirements are going to be for that. And, you know, just with the big open world, and especially if you do some of those big events where you've got like 100 people with you, uh, is my computer going to be able to run that? You know, I mean, I could get it for the PS5 potentially, but um, I don't know. I'm just curious what how that'll work if my if my current rig will even be able to run it or if not <clears throat> there's another game that oh god I love the I love everything about it except for the fact that it's not accessible a game came out on Steam I think in other consoles um, several years ago almost 10 years ago I think it's called Rocksmith. You know, you had the rock band Guitar Hero craze in the late 2000s. I played the hell out of some Guitar Hero and Rock Band, a lot of those games. They're fun. But they're simplified. You know, you got these plasticky guitars with buttons and stuff on them. Rocksmith was basically the next step of that and the next evolution to say, hey, we're going to teach you how to actually play the real guitar. You know, and I, I've played guitar for several years, you know, learned it a little bit when I was a kid, but never really got very far into it. I always sort of hit a plateau, never really had a lot of people to kind of teach me. You know, I'd look up some basic tablatures on the internet and stuff like that. But other than, you know, you know, I could play a few songs here and there, but nothing, <laughs> nothing big. I'm probably better at drums than I am at guitar these days. Um, matter of fact, I pretty much know I am. You know, I at least could play more songs, I'll put it that way. So Rocksmith, you know, you basically have this cord that you plug into one end into your, your guitar jack, and then you plug it into your computer, and it can recognize, like, the sound and everything of your guitar, and it has all kinds of teaching tools. You know, you can pick songs and buy songs that you want to learn. They have this adaptive difficulty. They have these different, like, you know, you can re repeat and slow down certain parts of a song until you master it. <clears throat> you can just do all kinds of things. And I love, I absolutely love the interactive way that they've presented it. Well, they have this um, Rocksmith Plus now, which takes that a step further and adds it where you can use your PC, console, or even your mobile device. You can get the app on your smartphone or tablet and log in and do it without even any extra equipment. And you can do acoustic and electric guitars, I guess, and with microphone. I have some, I have some thoughts or I have some concerns potentially about, you know, late, latency because music, you know, especially if you want to be on time and the pitch and everything, like you want to be in tune. And I know, I know they can help you get your thing tuned. That's not, the, that's the easy part. But as far as like, you know, playing along with a song, how much latency is there, especially if you're just doing it with a microphone and interpreting things live uh, without some sort of, you know, like wired connection or something. Yeah, maybe it's good enough now. I don't know. Um, but I like, I love everything that that is trying to do. I think it's a wonderful idea, but 
I like I said, I tried the old game for the PC. I have it on Steam, but I never really bought any DLC for it because, and I'm not quite sure where my cord is for it. It's probably in one of my desk drawers buried somewhere. But the problem is, it was just, you know, reading like fret numbers and seeing all the visual details <clears throat> is a lot harder than just seeing the colored four buttons on your play guitar. So I I just I could never see the interface well enough. <clears throat> I could never read the live uh visuals. <clears throat> Excuse me, something in my throat, I don't know. Um I, but I could never read them enough to really make it work. Like I so badly wanted to love it because I love guitar. I love rock and roll. I love metal. Um, I know other genres use guitar too, but primarily, you know, classic rock, um, metal, you know, a little bit of new rock, what, you know, whatever, new metal, whatever. Um, but just, I love guitar, you know, acoustic, electric, and I've always wanted to play it well, but I never really have. And I think this would be a great sort of tool, especially if you already, you know, sort of have like, oh, I understand, you know, some basic guitar fundamentals, you know, like using the frets and tuning the guitar and palm muting and and different things. And so I, I love everything about this. And, you know, they're having, like, where people can have almost like a video assistance where people can record videos and um, help other people who are struggling or they have a new tablature view with a more guitar players are used to reading they've got like where you can let's say you have a downloaded song that you're learning you do your own solo instead of the one that's in the song you can actually upload like hey here's my take on their solo and that's a cool idea so everything about it i like it's just i know that i'm probably not going to be able to play it i don't know how you would make something like that blind accessible I'm not saying that it can't be done, but there's a lot there. Um, there was this service that was, I wish it wouldn't have gone under, and I used it for a couple years. <clears throat> there was, <clears throat> excuse me, there was a service called Talking Tabs, and you would buy these songs, and they would walk you through. You didn't have to read music. You didn't have to read tablatures. But they were audio files, and I used to put them on my Victor Reader stream. And you would just play, you know, they would walk you through, okay, this measure, you play, an <clears throat> you play an E chord or an A chord or whatever. And then if it was, you know, just single fingering, you would, um, you know, third finger, fifth fret, fourth finger, second fret, I don't know, whatever. Um, but it, it worked. Like, I learned a couple songs that I really wanted to learn that way. Um, and there is... Oh, God, what is his name? Oh, There's a guy that's still doing it, and I've bought a couple of his songs, too. I've learned a couple of songs I wanted to from him, too. Although, I haven't played in a while, so I've kind of forgotten what I've learned. Um, <clears throat> God, what is his name? <sighs> It, just look up guitar by ear or piano by ear. He's got, he's got a couple different um, things, but he does a really good job too. Um, I want to give him credit. I'm sorry, dude, I can't remember your name off the top of my head. But if you want to learn like guitar or piano <clears throat> or even drums, hold on a minute. <clears throat> Okay, hopefully that takes care of it. <clears throat> but yes, guitar by ear, piano by ear. Um, they're good. He's got a drums, uh, like an intro to drum course, which I haven't actually fully gone through. I've gone through part of it, uh, some of his lessons, but I should really go back to that. But, um, you know, for drums, I've just been, you know, playing along to songs that I, that sound like ah, I can sort of figure this out. But he's got a lot of techniques and stuff there. So those are a couple things. So I love the idea of Rocksmith and Rocksmith Plus, but I just don't know that it's going to be blind accessible, unfortunately. But great idea. 
Um, the other one that stood out to me was um, Mario and Rabbids. Uh, something, I forget the, the subtitle. But, you know, they had this thing a couple years ago that nobody really knew about or thought would work. This real t- or this uh, turn-based sort of tactics game with Mario and the, Ray- the Rabbids from the Rayman series. And I guess it worked really well. Um, I did pick it up for like five bucks on a sale a while back, but haven't gotten around to it. And apparently, this one, instead of being on one place, instead of just the Mushroom Kingdom, they're going to have almost like a Mario Galaxy thing where you're going to different planets and doing different things. And um, they're actually taking away the grid. So it seems to be more of like a free form. You can move in a certain area. And it's a kind of a combination of like turn-based real-time. Um, I heard somebody compare it to a game I've wanted to check out and just really haven't gotten around to, Valkyria Chronicles, I believe, where the whole thing is like you have a certain amount of time on your turn, and you can freely move, you can take cover, you can shoot, you can kind of do whatever, but you only have a certain time, and you can only move within a certain distance from where you started. So I I don't know. I'm potentially sort of intrigued about that, you know, and uh, people really love it, so um, good on them, you know, I'm glad, I mean, A, Nintendo's trusting an outside developer with, uh, with some of their major franchises, and um, that it's working as well as it is, I wish they would reach out to somebody if they don't want to make a new F-Zero game, or Metroid game, but hey, hopefully we'll get that here on Tuesday, but yeah, so Mario looks pretty cool, Mario and Rabbids looks pretty cool, um, I know there's a lot of people hating on this one. Uh, they ended with this, uh, Avatar game and it's coming out in what, 2022, 2023, I forget. But, you know, it looked really good. At first I thought it was some sort of prehistoric thing and I'm like, wait a minute. I saw the mech, they saw this like mech coming out. I'm like, and then I saw like the blue guys and it's like, oh, the, wait a minute. This is Avatar, I think. Sure enough. Um, yeah, you know, James Cameron, he's going to do his second Avatar movie. A lot of people hated the first Avatar. I did see it in theaters. Um, I thought it was one of the few movies that did 3D pretty well. There were things that I could actually see with the 3D. I mean, was it the greatest plotted movie ever? No, no, not really. But, you know, it was just a fun movie. Like, I didn't mind it. I, I kind of enjoyed it actually uh i know some people are gonna hate that but whatever i don't care um i'm sort of curious what the new movie is going to be and if hey if ubisoft makes kind of this open world action adventure if they kind of take like a legend of zelda or immortals phoenix rising-esque style maybe don't make it as formulaic you know mix things up a little bit but you know i could see you know you riding on those giant bird things um Maybe you take, oh, you know, you're fighting these guys, you know, that have all this, this earth people that have the technology and whatnot, the mechs and everything. You take over their mech and you can use a mech. I don't know. There, to me, there's potential with it. Everyone just automatically hates it just because, oh, it's Avatar. We, it's the cool thing to hate, so let's hate it. Um, I don't know. I, I'll, I'm, I'm, I'm taking a wait-and-see approach. I mean, I thought it graphically looked cool, so we'll see. Uh, did I miss anything major? They had some sort of Just Dance thing, but I don't really care about that, so I didn't really pay much attention to that segment. Um, those were the major segments that stood out. Um, Far Cry 6, of course. Um, oh, that was... Hold on. (coughs) God, my... I try to do a video, excuse me, and my head just goes crazy. I get something in my throat, and then I get a sneezing fit here. God, what's going on? Um, Far Cry 6 was the other thing that they kind of concentrated on. And uh, they not really a lot of gameplay, but they, they were really building up this bad guy. And, yeah, he's pretty stone cold. I mean, he's basically, you know, just there are so many they got this group of people and they're protesting and then this, this guy and uh, he just, just kills one, just boom, shot to the head. Um, 
his son is trying to get him to let some of these people go and just let them work for him. And it just, you know, he leaves this boat and like, okay, yeah, yeah, we'll let them go. Sure, sure. And then they, it cuts to black and you just hear a bunch of gunfire and, uh, oh yeah, he just straight up kills a bunch of people. I mean, this guy is pretty savage. Um, and then they already talked about post-launch, you know, they want to have for their season pass, they want to have, uh, they're talking about having the, um, kind of a, you, you play from different villains of the series, you play their perspective, so you get their side of it more, you're not really playing as the good guy, so you're playing more ruthlessly, I guess, which could be interesting, but yeah, man, there, there's, uh, some pretty gnarly stuff happening there, um, that was Ubisoft, really. I mean, I thought it was not a bad show. I mean, there really wasn't... I mean, Avatar was a surprise. I did not see that coming whatsoever. But aside from that, like, I, we knew that this this extraction... It used to be called, I think, Quarantine. And then they thought, eh, with the last year, maybe we shouldn't go quite that, uh, quite that way. So they renamed it to Extraction. But... Yeah, I I thought their show was pretty solid, you know? Um, And you don't have to have tons of surprises as long as you make a good show. And I thought it was alright. I'm honestly really kind of looking forward to trying that uh, Riders Republic game. And then they had a couple of other things. Um, Devolver Digital... Uh, they didn't really show too many games I was interested in. They kicked it off with Shadow Warrior 3, which does look cool. I definitely want to check that out when it comes out this year. Not sure exactly when, but this year, they say. Um, that looks cool. I still got to get around to playing Shadow Warrior 2. Um, so that looked good, but the best thing that I liked about, you know, I've talked about Devolver Digital and the way they do their completely nuts stories um their devolver verses they even kind of made fun of it this year um but their their kind of parody message that was really on point this year was just making fun of um god what do they call it like the devolver plus program or devolver plus something but they were basically just completely ripping on and making fun of everything from like, oh, you got to be a constant monetization. You got to do the subscription. You got to do microtransaction. And instead of uh, <clears throat> exclusive, it would be premium purchase. There's always this chick that was, uh, before each thing, premium purchase. Um, <clears throat> it's like, oh, yeah, you can actually buy the game. And then they went so far as there was one title that I like the idea of it, but the footage that they show on. I, I just, it, it's a little bit hard to see. There's a lot of, it's like an overhead shooter and there was just bullets flying and some of the contrast was a little rough. And it's a Switch title, I guess, but it's only going to be released, theoretically, in physical form. So once it comes out, uh, I want to say it's not till next year, but um, you're only going to be able to buy it, theoretically, in a physical cartridge. So they're like, nope, you know, we're going the other way just with this title to prove a point. And, uh, you know, remember when you actually had to buy things and they were real instead of just a bunch of zeros and ones? <laughs> and then they went from, oh, God, what what did they call it? They, they're making fun of NFTs. It was really great. Um, but it's not, I don't, you know, the real NFTs is this non-fungible, which I've never even heard before until NFTs. But <clears throat> uh, it was like, what was it, like non-fuck-upable or something like that? Um, it was just like, yeah, God, the modern gaming monetization. I'm, I'm almost thoroughly convinced that, you know, that's where your indie gamers are, or your indie developers are great because they, a lot of them, unless they're developing for mobile, really haven't gone down this route yet. But like your triple A developers, they start a project and go, what kind of monetization scheme can we make? And then what kind of, uh, hmm, what kind of game or franchise can we shoehorn in to make people want to buy it? I swear to God, it's the monetization 
season passes, microtransactions, skins. Um, it's all of that crap first, and then I guess we'll put a game in there, and then we'll we'll make it a uh, a franchise that everyone's familiar with, so that the, you know we'll trick people into buying it and paying for it continuously. I'm just I am so freaking sick of that, and it's. I really, I do have, now that I got my new iPad, I, I've i got a three-month subscription offer uh, just to try it out for Apple Arcade, and I'm really thinking about it because, again, you go to the App Store, and I want, you know, I'm not opposed to gaming on my iPad. I like gaming on my iPad, especially if I'm listening to something uh, or on my phone. But, God, man, every game, it's free, but... There's timers, there's ads, there's ads on top of ads, there's crap that interrupts the gameplay, there's waiting, there's gems and 14 different currencies. Fuck off. I just I am so sick of it. And Devolver Digital was just so on point about that. I'm like, oh. I mean, at least somebody has the balls to say it. Um, so there wasn't a whole lot in their show that I remember being, oh, well, that's really cool. Um, cause a lot of the games were just not really kind of my style. I, oh, that's the one where I saw that first person game I was talking about earlier, I think. Um, and then the other one that I watched, which was really kind of a disappointment was, um, Gearbox had a show. And to be honest with you, I think they might have showed... Like, I think they might have showed a little bit of tiny that Tiny Tina game or a little more of a blurb, but that was a waste of time. I mean, it was the most, the vast majority of it was Randy Pitchford, uh, I believe is his name, um, on the set of the Borderlands movie, which is fine, but just, you know, going in expectations for E3, you're expecting some game announcements or coverage or something, and you sure absolutely have a section on the Borderlands movie. That makes sense. Everyone else is showing about movies and anime. Fine, but it was kind of boring, honestly. Um, so I really didn't get much out of that one. So yeah, other than the Tiny Tina thing, did they even have any other game? I I don't. It was like a twenty thirty minute presentation, and I don't even know. Yeah. <laughs> if I, if there was anything, I forgot about it. So <clears throat> that is a summary of Saturday's events. Boy, uh, I'll probably do a video for Monday. I'll probably record it tomorrow because after all of today's events, I'm going to be exhausted. Um, I'm going to stream the Microsoft One. I'm going... I don't know if I'm going to stream any of the other ones, though. We have Square Enix... We have PC Gaming Show. We have the Future Game Fest thingy. There's a shorter Back for Blood thing, but I think that's focused on PvP and not necessarily the campaign. Um, hell, there might even be one or two other ones floating around there. But for sure, I'm going to stream. And, and I already found out. I already added a reminder on YouTube. Um, Microsoft is having a audio described version of their keynote yay good job microsoft good job so yeah uh we're gonna have at least like four or five events today uh, i will stream one for sure not sure about the it depends if people show up or not um you know i streamed a couple the last day or two and i don't think i had any viewers so the Microsoft is the really big one. I really want to know what both Bethesda and Microsoft are going to announce. So that one for sure I will. But I think what I'll do, especially with this year, I know, like I said, a lot of people are releasing videos on demand of their reactions to conferences and, you know, kind of like people streaming over them. And it's just a little wishy-washy as far as, like, what's allowed and, you know, no one's really seeming to take central responsibility like e3 is like oh i don't know you got to check with all the each provider youtube or twitch or whatever and then you know it's it's really dumb because you have services like youtube and twitch 
and things like that. And they, they don't like, yeah, they want you to make content, but like they don't stick up for the creator. They don't stick up for the, the video maker or the streamer. So, you know, it's like, yeah, do what you want. But the moment you step out of line or you do something remotely that we don't want or that our whoever doesn't like, you know, then we'll get mad at you. So that is the tentative plan. Um, we will be live for the Microsoft thing for sure. Square, eh, maybe, because they're another big publisher. You got Square and Eidos, and I think they're wrapped up in it. So they might have some neat stuff, and they're a AAA thing. So we'll see. Again, if, if Microsoft does well, if anyone shows up, maybe. Otherwise, I'll just watch it and report back tomorrow. So that is the plan. That is a summary of uh, yesterday and the plan for Sunday. And then uh, Monday and Tuesday, there's a bunch of just scattered stuff on Monday. I don't even really have that schedule figured out yet. Tuesday, we'll definitely stream the um, the Nintendo one. That is the, uh, the last one that I'm really interested in. I want to see their Nintendo Direct and what the heck they're going to announce for the Switch. And I doubt they're going to do a new hardware, but there's always a remote chance. So... Anyway, hope you guys enjoyed it. You can follow me on Twitter at BGFH79, twitch.tv slash illegally cited. And if you follow me on Twitter, I will let you know when I go live there. And uh, you can follow me on uh, illegallycited.com and right here on YouTube. So until next time, I will chat with everybody again later.